started, uh, this is uh, class four of the DC controls classes, and our topic today is breaker failure uh, relaying. And uh, before we get started, I want to have a safety tip. And the tip that I want to talk about today is, if you're in a substation, what do you do if you accidentally trip a breaker? Hopefully this will never happen to you, it has never happened to me, but I have known people that did this. And what you really want to do, you, you have at this point, done something that you really probably shouldn't have done. And what you have to do, first off, is do not close the breaker back in. What you have to do is you have to make contact with the people that are in control of that substation, and it's usually referred to as dispatch, and follow their instructions. And what their instructions will most likely be is to do nothing and wait till someone else arrives, or they may talk to you and they may re-energize it uh, via SCADA. But do not do it yourself. And you, at this point, you also want to be very upfront with them and, and a, a little humility at this point would also probably be a really good idea. Anyway, uh, that's safety tip for the day. Um, today we're going to talk, as I said, about breaker failure, relaying, and the general concept of backing up breakers so that if the breaker does not operate, you still clear the fault. An uncleared fault on the system, regardless of what voltage is that, is completely unacceptable and will generally lead to a cascading failure and outage of the entire system. It becomes really, really critical that within a very short amount of time that you clear faults. So again, if a breaker doesn't operate, it's th that, that's a very serious situation and it has to be addressed in your relaying schemes. So we're going to start with looking at, um, at how uh, uh, you back up circuit breakers in, in a simple radial uh, scheme something like a, an AC panel, for instance, in your house, or the AC panel in a station service system within a substation. We'll then go up and uh, go up a voltage to the distribution level and look how it's done there. Then we'll go up to the transmission voltage and see how, uh, how we accomplish it a, at each one of these. Um, I'm going to introduce to you then uh, basic breaker failure logic. If you only remember one thing out of this class, I want this to be it. I want everyone to understand the basics, just how, what basic uh, breaker failure logic is. Real important. Um, and then we're going to conclude with a, a little lesson that I learned many years ago that involves breaker failure relaying. Okay, if you look at what I've drawn here on the whiteboard, I've got a system that, you know, we might find in a, uh, in a substation, and I've drawn all the way down in voltage to the, the AC panel that uh, would be providing our station service, okay? And so, this is the AC panel, I've got a 100 amp main breaker. What happens if we have a fault on this little feeder, and this little 20 amp breaker fails to clear it, for whatever reason? The yeah, the main will open, because you'll You'll have a fault out here. Presumably, it's enough current that you're going to be able to operate, you know, hit the main, and then the, the main breaker will, will pick that up. Okay, and pretty straightforward. Uh, and you, you'd have the same thing at your house. You know, you've got a main breaker of some fashion, and uh, if, you, uh, if one of these breakers... Now, th th these are molded case uh, breakers. It's a very mature technology. It's stuff that generally isn't going to fail on you, but again, just in case it did, you have backup. And again, this is just a coordinated overcurrent protection. Does that make sense? Okay, if you go up then a level, and say this is a distribution uh, switch gear, say this is, is 12.5 or in the, the local Portland General System, uh, 13 kV, and say you had a fault out here on, on this cable right there, now, what would happen if this breaker fails to trip? That, that's the breaker that's got to back it up. There's really nothing else that can, so in some fashion, you've got to, to, to back that up. Now then, the question I have for you is, how fast can that operate? You've got coordinated uh, overcurrent protection, so this one's got to have a slower trip 
than this, because obviously you want this to trip before that. Well, you're usually going to, to it's going to, you're going to, it'll be somewhere on the order of 10 cycles difference. And again, it depends on the, the relaying scheme, how that would work and how quickly you can, uh, um, how quickly you can accomplish this. Okay, now here's a question for you. Say this fault, instead of being outside of this, say this metal clad switch gear, instead of this fault being out on the cable, what, what would it be? be like if you had the fault actually back in here inside the breaker. So it's actually, you know, if you're a human being standing out in front of that breaker, there's a, a, a sizzling fault within a couple feet of you. Now, is that 10-ish cycle delay, is that okay in that situation? And if you think it is, I would encourage you to go onto YouTube and find, uh, and just put in uh, the search names of Arc Flash, and listen to some of the stories about Arc Flash, and and how horrific that the injuries can be if someone is exposed to uh, you know directly to electrical flashes in an arcing. So it, it, in once you do that, I think you'll agree with me that a ten cycle delay at this point is not okay. That is not it, that that is just simply not uh, not acceptable. And so there are some schemes that people have come up with that essentially what you do is when this relay detects a fault, it trips this breaker and sends a signal to that relay telling it that it's seen a fault. And if this relay sees a fault and it doesn't get that blocking signal, it will trip very quickly. And what, what that will allow you to do is set this relay so that instead of a 10-ish cycle delay, it's a two-cycle delay. Uh, you know, huge benefits. And again, I encourage you to go to, to YouTube and kind of brush up on, you know, what a horrific phenomena uh, uh, arc flash uh, can be and how badly people can be uh, hurt and killed by it. So, okay, I any questions on that? All right, now then, let's take another step up in voltage and let's get up to our transmission system. Now it gets a lot more complicated because it's no longer a radial system. Now in a radial system, you just have a source upstream of you and there's no source down here. So you, can, uh, you, you know or you can assume safely that all your fault current is just flowing in one uh, direction. Ah, yes, but here you no longer have that assumption. And so you can no longer have coordinated overcurrent protection to solve your backup problem. Okay, does that make sense? Good, because this is the point that we have to jump into into uh, uh, break failure schemes. Now then, say we had this situation where we've got a fault within this within this switch rack, and uh, it doesn't get cleared for whatever reason. How are you going to then clear the fault? Well, it's going to be at all your remote substations that are connected by, with by transmission lines. They're going to see that fault, and they will trip for it. And they will see it in what's called, and we're going to actually cover this next week, because next week we're going to start in line relaying. And they're going to see that as what's referred to as a zone two fault. And there's a significant time delay involved in that. So it's going to be on the order of 20 cycles of delay, you know, additional delay during, uh, to clear that fault. And 20 cycles is a really, really long time in, you know, for, for power grid, you know, for power systems. Within human perception, it's very short, but 20 cycles in some parts of the grid is enough that you're gonna get a voltage collapse and you're, you're gonna start getting a cascading uh, uh, failure and pause, start losing generation, and you can end up um, having a regional blackout from this. So again, these are really, really, it's really important that we don't let that happen and that we have schemes that will prevent it. So anyway, the purpose of a breaker failure scheme is to the extent possible to isolate a failed breaker 
and to, again, to the extent possible, contain that within the boundaries of that substation so you're not having to trip circuit breakers remotely. Now you'll see, we'll see in a minute that that, um, that part where I say to the extent possible is a pretty big, uh, pretty important caveat. Okay, again, speed is essential because this we're really getting into a, a, a place where the stability of the system is really at risk. Um, a typical cause for this, probably the most uh, common cause, is a problem with your DC supply that uh, is your control voltage for the circuit breaker. No DC supply, no trip and circuit breaker. And that's your most common thing. Um, human error, very common. Leaving a test switch open. I haven't really uh, talked about test switches yet, although I plan on doing it next week um, when we start talking about uh, line relaying. But those little test switches, a human forgets to close one up and uh, you've now got an open circuit. Um, you can also have mechanical failure of your breaker. You could have insulation breakdown within the circuit breaker, so in some uh, fashion it's already flashed over. Uh, recall that one of the options in circuit breakers for low gas is to block operate. Okay, so if you have low gas, you, and, and that's the, the, uh, you know, the policy of that utility to use the block trip function, well, there's another, uh, uh, another thing that can cause you to uh, have breaker failure. Oh yes, let's talk about testing errors for a moment. Um, when a breaker failure scheme trips, it's a big deal, and we'll see that here in a minute, because you have to go outside, you know, uh, and start tripping adjacent circuit breakers. And in certain configurations, that's a colossal deal because you can um, now outage a bunch of other things. You know, you, you might have had a, a line fault. Well, now, because your breaker failed, you're having to trip other things within that that substation. So it's a pretty draconian thing to do, and you really only want to do it when you really need it. However, these are very important schemes, so they have to be regularly tested to make sure that they're going to operate when called upon. And unfortunately, um, in my experience, probably about half the times I've heard of breaker failure schemes operating, it was due to a testing error during testing. And I'll, I've got a, a good story at the end of the class that I'll tell about this. Okay, any questions about that? Again, I think this is all pretty straightforward, and it kind of gets back to where we started in the first class, that there's no one thing about any of this that's very complicated. However, when you start putting it together, okay, yes, then you do get some complications. All right, I want to take a, a moment out and introduce you to a new relay, which is the 62, which is a time delay relay. Now, there are two, two versions of this, and uh, I've got one right here in my hand. And essentially, this is just uh, our, our old friend, the 95, an auxiliary relay. However, it has one difference. And that is, when you energize the coil, there will be a definite and adjustable time delay between when you energize it and when the contacts change state. And that's known as a time delay on pickup, or TDPU. Now the other variation is a time delay on dropout, and that in that case it picks up immediately. However, when you remove uh, control voltage from the coil, it, the, the contacts will remain in their changed state for a settable amount of time. Okay, does that make sense? It's pretty intuitive. Again, I'll, I'll pass this around. It's not all that interesting. It looks just like a, uh, uh, an aux um, relay, although it has these little toggles on the top that you can set it for a definite you know, a, a time to land pickup. Again, it looks just like a, a 95, and the contact uh, development is generally the same. The, in the, the one I handed out, it fits into the same pin uh, for wiring, that, uh, or socket, excuse me, for wiring that uh, an auxiliary relay does. I believe that one has two Form C contacts for its outputs. Now, if you were to depict this in logic, which is more and more how we do these things, you know, they, they used to sell a lot of those relays for substation applications, and these days they really don't do it that much anymore because you can program this uh, into most microprocessor-based relays really, really easily. 
And the way that looks is it's just a box. And built into it are two places that you can put uh, uh, your time delays. And this is the time delay on pickup. And this is the time delay on dropout. And the, these will be measured in, you can measure them in milliseconds, in cycles, or in seconds. And in my view, I, I, my preference is to measure it in cycles. When I'm doing work like this, my brain thinks in cycles, not milliseconds. But again, it, it's pretty much uh, the, same, uh, the same thing. Okay, any questions about that? H have people seen this before? Okay, we'll, we'll see it here in a minute on, on the example that I've got here in, in a couple slides. Okay, this is the basic logic for breaker failure schemes. Really, really worth committing this to memory. And what it really, what you're really doing here, you've got a 50 BF. Does anyone remember what the 50 ANSI number is? Instantaneous overcurrent. Okay, so the idea is that um, your relaying, you know, your circuit breaker is seeing fault current. That's the first thing you need is you've got to see fault current. And then BFI is referred to as breaker failure initiate. <clears throat> what your BFI contacts are is every one of your protective relays that would see that fault, you're going to take another contact and wire it to your breaker failure scheme. And you'll put it in series with your 50 BF. So, and then you put that in series with the coil from your time delay relay. So if you have fault current and you have a breaker failure initiate, now you start the timer. Okay, and if the timer times out, then you're going to close that contact on the next leg over of the ladder and you're going to trip a lockout relay. And that's when you, you clean house and you, you, you trip the, uh, um, the breakers on you know, all adjacent breakers for that. And we'll get to the tripping logic here in just a second. Okay, does this make sense? Can, did, does, did, can you see that this is going to, to meet the need of our, of our, uh, 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 of our relay scheme? Now, in, implicit in this is the idea that that 50 BF will drop out at the exact instant that you're going to, uh, when, when uh, fault current stops going through the breaker. It's not going to, to pick up and then stay on a couple more cycles. It's gonna, it, it comes up and it drops right back out as soon as the fault's cleared. Okay, does that make sense? I'm seeing a few quizzical looks here. Can you just sure. go on the board what you mean like okay. Kind of sure. Okay. What happens? Let's let's say that. Uh, give me a moment here to draw this. Okay. This axis will be time. And then on this axis, say is 50 BF. And then BFI. Okay. So we're we're going along. We're going along where everything's fine, and all of a sudden, okay, all of a sudden a fault occurs. Let me stand over on this side. All of a sudden a fault occurs, and <clears throat> about the same time, well, let's see, the fault occurs here, so your 50 BF is going to pick up. About the same time, if not maybe a second later, or I, sh I should be more cautious now I say it, much less than a second later, you're going to pick up your breaker failure initiate, okay? And say, you're, say that starts here, and your time delay, your 62 element, will, will pick up there, okay? So these go along, and ideally, you're going to clear the fault, and that will drop down, or drop out, and that will do it at the same time. And I call that success. That's a successfully cleared fault. 
Now then, what happens if we don't successfully clear the fault? And remember we've got, that's our, our critical point, that if we don't clear it by then, we're going to go into break or failure. Okay? Does that make sense? So if all of a sudden this occurs, well, now you're going to go into break or failure. You're going to trip breakers further out from the one you were trying to, to clear the fault with. And now that had better work. And then at that point, everything drops back out. Okay. Now then, what I can do is put one more line here and show the, the, break, the lockout relay. Because at this point, lockout relay trips. And once a lockout relay trips, remember uh, the 86 function, you don't reset that. It stays locked out until a human being goes, investigates the problem, and resets the lockout relay. Did that, did that answer the question? Did that help? Dave, yeah, you, you had looked quizzically at this. Oh, I, I'm going to look something right now. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's uh, let me draw a uh, let me draw a trip bus, and I'm going to do it for I'm going to do it for this breaker right here in the middle. Okay. So there's your your DC negative. DC positive, and then there's your uh, there's your 52 your trip coil. Now you've got two things that are tripping it. Um, one is your uh, uh, transformer, and let's say that that has a lockout relay. And then you've got a line over on the other side, and so it's got a, a, a 21 is a, a line relay. So that's what would be tripping that breaker. Now then, say we're, we've executed this logic in a microprocessor-based relay, and so over here, we're going to have... Okay, and this is going to be ANSI number 11, which is a multi-purpose relay. And, and these will be inputs to this relay. So you're, at the same time that you go to trip the breaker, you're going to tell the relay that you've got breaker failure initiates. Okay. Now this relay also has uh, current inputs from the CT, you know, one of the CTs off of this breaker. And that's where it's getting the 50 BF contact from. In the olden days, you would, you would actually have a relay that was dedicated, you know, an uh, 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 electromagnetic relay that was dedicated to that function, but now we just put it in with a, a, a microprocessor-based relay that's, you know, doing a multitude of, uh, of functions. Okay? Does that, Dave, does that, that help, help the question a bit? Yeah, when you're telling, when you're recognize, when you have a protective trip, that's when the break, you go to trip the breaker and you provide the BFI in the sa at the same instant, same basic function, you do two things. So, so think of it when you're wiring up a protective relay in, in your, your overall um, scheme, remember that you have to provide two output contacts for it. One is to trip the breaker and one is to go to the breaker um, to, to that breaker's uh, breaker failure relaying scheme. Okay? So what's the breaker trip pressure? Um, per, maybe, maybe not, because if it's a lockout relay, say it's, and here's the, here's the rub on that, is that would be the case on the 21, but it would not be the case on the 86. Okay, um, let's, let's, that's a really good question. Say your fault is over here on this transformer. Your differential scheme will recognize it. 
and it's going to trip a lockout relay. And that lockout relay should trip these two breakers and that breaker. Okay? So at the same time, now this breaker, the way we've drawn it, actually doesn't have its own breaker failure scheme, so don't worry about it. But on these two, uh, it, it does. So that, that lockout relay is going to trip these two breakers, and it's going to provide BFIs to their, uh, their relays. Now, and you can think of, think of it this way. Every time that you wire up a, a lockout relay, you, you need three contacts. You need a trip, a breaker failure initiate, and a block close. Okay, remember um, last class we talked about the, the supervisory leg and doing that? So every time you go through in, in a, you know, if you're designing, say, a new substation with that configuration, each one of these is going to have, uh, you know, each, each lockout relay in this, you're going to have that functionality. Okay, did that, that help? Cool. Now then, when you do this, you're going to have, let me get a pin, you're going to have a lockout relay, the 86BF, for this breaker. Okay, for this breaker right here, what does that, uh, what does that lockout relay have to trip? Well, it's got to trip that breaker, and it's got to trip that breaker. Uh-oh, we have a transmission line. What do we do about the transmission line? You know, say the fault was right here that we didn't work right, you know, that, that we didn't uh, operate the bre breaker correctly for. Now what do we do? Because that transmission line wasn't involved in it. Its relaying is, is perfectly happy. Um, it, the, you know, it, there was some fault current probably flowing in on that line, but that's not a, a, a thing that you're going to trip over. Well, here's uh, a, another... Uh, another feature in this, I think I've already talked about that. Uh, so anyway, protective, I got off my, my, my slide script here, but protective relays initiate the breaker failure. Um, control trips do not. So control switch or SCADA, if it doesn't operate, you leave it alone. You, do, you, you don't do the breaker failure. But... Uh, uh, I'm, let me, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. Let me just go ahead and answer your question. You have to have a breaker failure transfer trip to the other end of the line. Hopefully you've got communications on that line. Most modern line relaying, you have communications between the ends. You've got to send a, breaker, uh, a transfer trip to the other end of the line to tell the breaker to both trip and do not reclose. And we're going to cover reclosing in, in a few weeks. But... Uh, Anyhow, does that make sense now? So when you have, again, when this breaker goes into breaker failure, you trip these two, and you have to send a transfer trip to the other end of the line. Rob? What are the ways that you can uh, say that? Is it fiber, telephone line? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fiber, phone line, um, tone. There's, there, there, there's a thing called, um, uh, uh, well, I don't want I, I Two classes, we're going to cover all of that. Yeah. We'll cover the, the, whole, the whole kit and caboodle then. Okay, any other questions on this? Um, let me get back to where I started here. Okay, and again, uh, protective trips are what do BFIs, not control trips. And uh, now here's a question for you. What would happen if... The reason for this trip was a fault actually in the transformer, and it wasn't a high current fault, so your relaying didn't actually see fault current. Say it was a sudden pressure relay, and, and you did not have a fault, and you failed to operate this breaker, but there's no fault current going in. That's actually a tough question. Because, and it really gets to a philosophical question for your client, because some people would say, then you do not go into fault or into breaker failure, no matter what, because it's such a big deal 
to, you know, to our substation, if you do, that we're not, gonna, we're not going there. We're not going to have break of failure. However, others, and the example I have for you uh, that we're going to be going on here in, in just a minute, does make a differentiation of this. And what they do at that point for certain types of faults is they bypass the, uh, that, uh, the, the 50 BF. So if you're called upon to trip and you are, are it, it's from a contact or a source that might not have fault current associated with it, then all you do is you run the timer. And if it times out and you have not yet tripped, then you do go into breaker failure. One of the things that's interesting is people really didn't consider that option very often in the old days, 20, 25 years ago, where you had to build these things out of discrete uh, relays. Now that you can program it into a microprocessor-based relay, you get a lot more variations and you can take into consideration a lot more uh, different situations such as a, a protective trip that doesn't involve fault current. Does that make sense? And I think you'll see this here in, uh, in just a minute when we, uh, uh, when we look at the example. Now then, one really common feature is a thing called a retrip. <clears throat> and it's a little hard to uh, execute in, uh, in, with discrete devices. I, to tell you the truth, when I started doing this, 25 some odd years ago, I'd never heard of a retrip. It was only when you had, you, we got more powerful relays, you know, more capable re relays, probably a better way to say it, that uh, I, I heard of this idea. And so what you do is, um, and it really only works, or it's generally only helpful if you have two different trip coils. And the idea what you do is you put all your trips on the first trip coil, <clears throat> and as soon as the breaker C, or the breaker failure relay sees a breaker failure initiate, it then closes in on the, the uh, second trip coil. And it does all the other things at the same time, starts the timer and all that, but that way, if either of the trip coils is healthy, you're going to trip the breaker. Now, it doesn't help you if you've had a mechanical failure in the breaker, but those are actually pretty uncommon. You usually, the, the reasons for, for a breaker failure usually involve uh, the DC supply to the breaker. Okay, does, did that make sense on, on retrip? Again, not overwhelmingly complicated, but you know, perhaps not intuitive either. Okay, I think we pretty well covered this. We already talked about uh, tripping the adjacent breakers. Let me throw something out at you here. What if this, get rid of this, and say our, our breaker configuration on one side is a breaker and a half, and the other side is just a radial feed. But say that there's sources um, to these. Say that, that this goes out into a sub-transmission network somewhere, and somewhere out there, there's another source. So that you could have fault current going this way. Okay? Now, say, at that point, you've got to have breaker failure schemes on everything. Okay, so this has got a 50 BF, and then that's going to trip an 86 BF. Okay. If this guy trips, what, what does he have to, to do? What does he have to trip? So this, this breaker fails, goes into breaker failure. This guy has to trip the high side breakers, these two, but it also has to trip every one of these. And that means this whole switch rack is de-energized. It's been completely tripped off. This is one of the big reasons that you generally don't like to have radial schemes in your substations. Now there's a, a scheme called a main and transfer, and they would be this but with a transfer bus. It's still a radial scheme. If you have something like this, it is going, and you have a breaker failure, you have now lost your entire substation. Now compare that to a breaker and a half scheme where 
Say you have a breaker failure on this breaker. Well, you're going to trip this bus, and you're going to trip this guy, that circuit breaker. But notice, you've only lost one position. You've not lost the whole, you know, your, your, your entire station. Okay, does that make sense? This is a real important concept. This is really, in my mind, the reason that you very seldom see that scheme in, uh, in, on modern transmission systems. The example I'm going to give you at the end of the class was from a project where we converted a, a, a substation that was laid out like this into a substation that was laid out like that. Okay? All right. I'd like you to now go to the DC schematic that you've got in front of you. And um, and what this is, there's a bunch of different things in, in this uh, that I, I I'm, we're going to come back to this drawing in about three weeks to talk about reclosing schemes. And that's what a number of the features are on this. However, over on the right side of the drawing, this is the input um, portion right here to the relay. And these are all of your breaker failure initiates that have fault current associated with them. And this is, this is a, a, from a, a line relaying position. And so these are all line relays um, that are connected into this. So that's your breaker failure initiate. And that's the part of this that you'll see, uh, or that you would, if you were designing around this, uh, this scheme, that's where you would put your BFIs. Now notice that they use uh, <coughs> the abbreviation BFH. And in the, uh, this is from Southern California Edison, and in their uh, way of, of abbreviating, that means it's a breaker failure initiate that is associated with fault current. Okay? That makes sense? Now then, they don't use a lockout relay in their schemes because this particular device has enough output contacts that, uh, that you can just wire them straight from this. And you can read below these uh, in the areas that, uh, like right down here, the, the trips for the various uh, 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 circuit breakers that are adjacent to this one. Again, it's a breaker and a half scheme. And I believe I picked one that was a middle breaker. And so you can see that you have you know, this goes to the two on the outside. But look at all these over here. Those are the various line relays that have communications to the other ends of the transmission lines. Okay? And what you're doing with all, every one of those is your keying transfer trip. <coughs> and there's two ways that you can do transfer trip. One is, is where you pulse it where you're the, the circuit breaker at the other end of the line, I'm saying trip, and then I remove it. Or you can say trip and hold it in place, and that's how it differentiates between a, a trip for a line in which it can reclose, or a breaker failure where you do not want it to reclose. Now, in its logic, there's a timer that if, you tie, if it's held, um, uh, you know, keyed for a certain amount of time, then it's going to completely disable the reclosing scheme. Okay, does that make sense? I'm trying to, trying to go from, you know, kind of the theory behind it to an actual application. All right. Now then, that actually doesn't tell you very much. I mean, it tells you how to, to, to put all your, uh, all your wiring to wire up the circuit, or the, the relay and the circuit breaker, but it doesn't tell you how it's programmed. So now I want you to go to uh, the other drawing that I... Uh, <coughs> provided. And let's walk through this uh, for a minute. Okay. On the far left side are all of the inputs to the scheme. And the top part, this is your uh, 50BF. 
which is phase and neutral overcurrent. Okay, and notice that it's going to an OR gate. So coming out right here where I've got the cursor, that's your uh, 50 BF. Yeah, it's, it sh you should be able to see it right on the upper left-hand corner of your drawing. Okay, does that make sense? Here, I'll maybe back out just a little bit. Now then, going down this leg, you're having your breaker failure initiates, and you're having an on, there's essentially an on-off switch, which is the, the uh, auto, auto is the on position in, in the way they describe them. And what that lets the testman do is, uh, if for testing purposes, they can disable the scheme. Okay, any questions so far? Now is where th we start to, to see how this operates. Coming out of this OR gate, these are the two when you have fault current. So that goes into this AND gate, and then your auto, basically your on-off switch also goes in. So if the scheme is turned on, you have breaker failure initiate, and you have fault current, then the node that is, is referred to is a BFI H timing starts. And the part of, at this point, it hits an OR gate. Down on this side, you have your BFI low, which is for inputs that don't have fault current. And then it basically hits the same thing, hits an AND gate. So at once either of those happen, you hit this OR gate that's re called retrip. The logic up here is your retrip logic. Going down this leg is your timer, and here's your 62 BF. Notice it's got a pickup delay and no dropout delay. Okay? Now notice this looks different because it's not in ladder logic format. But it's that same basic breaker failure logic. Breaker failure initiate and fault current starts the timer. If the timer times out, then in this scheme, what you do is you set that latch. And then that latch, in turn, tr does all of this stuff. And these are all the outputs that we just looked at on the previous page. And that's how you program this, this relay into a breaker failure scheme. Simple, simple, simple. What could possibly go wrong? Does that make sense? How, how many of you were able to just follow that on the first shot? It, it, I, I will grant you that this does get a little bit complicated. Just a little bit, okay, all right. Well, yeah, sleep on it, you give it thought, but again, for all the little nuances and features of it, and there are, there are quite a few little bells and whistles in this. A as an example, these little diode symbols here, those are, are LEDs on the front face of the relay that can tell you various things. Most of them are actually used for testing the device. It's not actually an operational thing. Well, I'll tell you when, you, when you have one of these breaker failure schemes go, it, it, it happens so fast, it's really faster than human perception. You know, you're really talking, the whole thing is, um, is over in, um, you know, 10, 12 cycles. Now, here's a question for you. Let's look at this timer, which is our 62 BF. That is set in micro, uh, or in, in milliseconds, and that's, if I'm doing math right, 133 is about eight cycles. Where does that come from? Where, where do you, how do you come up with your breaker failure time delay? A good rule of thumb is that it is half of your zone two time delay. Now you might ask, Eric, where do you come up with a zone two time delay? That has to do with system stability, and what it really is, is how long of a fault can your system stand without um, starting to get such a bad voltage collapse 
you're jeopardizing the stability of your system and you could have a, a regional outage. Okay, and, and that stuff, you have to, you really, there's some significant modeling and studies work that has to be done uh, to determine that voltage, or that time delay, not a voltage. Anyway, any questions about that? If you're still kind of digesting this, sleep on it, maybe look the drawings over a bit, and let me know if you still have questions. Um, it's not essential that you know, that you at this time understand every nook and cranny, but what I really want you to get is that basic logic so that when you see this for the first time or the first, second, or third times, that, that it makes sense to you and you have enough information that you can at least get your design going and you know the right questions to ask you know, when, you're, when you're going. Like, how does the utility want to deal with, with uh, BFIs that might not have fault current associated with them? Uh, um, you know, what, what do they set their um, break or failure time delay at? Questions like that, but they're important things to understand for how these things work. Okay, any other questions right now? Because uh, I've got a, a couple other things that I want to cover here that I think will be enlightening. All right, one last point on this. What if we have a breaker where our, our client wanted to have it in the, if for low gas, you block operate, okay? So if, if your breaker has, has lost much of its gas, not so much as it tripped, o, tripped or uh, 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 flashed over, because otherwise you'd have a fault and you'd have already had to dealt with this, but you know that that breaker is not going to operate. Guaranteed, it's dead. Now then, I would suggest that what you do is add a contact that I'm showing right here in the middle so that you're going to bypass your breaker failure time delay and you're going to immediately, upon seeing fault current and breaker failure initiate, you will immediately go into breaker failure. Why wait? Waiting that extra 10 cycles is going to do you no good. And so if you're, again, my recommendation, if that's the, the way they're setting their breaker to deal with low gas, go ahead and add that one little feature. You can either wire it directly into the, the scheme or you can take it off an alarm contact and program it into your logic. But again, I, this is a feature that I would recommend that you add. All right, any questions on that? All right, I want to close today's session with a story. I like telling stories in case you hadn't noticed. And this is about a project that I did many, many years ago. And it's called St. Mary's Substation. And for reference point of view, geographic reference, here is uh, the city of Portland. And over on the west side, Portland General has St. Mary's. And it's the strong source for everything on the west side. It's, you know, it, it feeds some very important loads, including all of Intel, includes Nike headquarters. So, you know, it's a pretty big deal. The whole silicon forest out on the, the, the west side. And uh, this was, was originally designed in the 40s or 50s, and it was a main and transfer scheme originally. So your main bus was right here, and then you had a transfer bus in the back, and that was pretty much it, and it was a radial system. So if you had a break or failure in this um, scheme the way it was originally configured, you lost the whole substation. Okay, that's a bad thing. And there are other operational considerations that Portland General decided that they wanted to, ha to convert this to a breaker and a half scheme, at least on the, on the 230 side. There's a few complications on the 115 side that we'll save for another time. So anyway, we laid it out just like this, where you've got three, uh, three big transformers in the middle. Each one is connecting to a different part of the 115 system. And then you have three transmission lines this one going down here, 
goes to their Sherwood substation, and it's got a strong source behind it. There's a big BPA substation down there that uh, near Sherwood. So that line alone could carry that entire substation under almost all conditions. Similarly, this line right here goes to BPA Keeler. It's only two miles away, and that's a really big source. Really, really strong system. So that line can carry the entire load of the substation under most conditions. The other line, the one next, next to it, goes a long way to a place called Trojan. And it used to be, many years ago, a nuclear generating station. Now back in the day when, when Trojan was generating, that would be a strong source. <clears throat> well, Trojan is long gone, and that line cannot handle the load on this substation. It cannot, can, cannot keep it going uh, other than in the lightest loading situation. <clears throat> well, we had designed the project, and we had actually followed uh, Portland General's, uh, you know, they had dictated the layout of the substation, and we were pouring foundations, got a phone call one day, oh no, we made a mistake. There's a common point of failure. How many people see the common point of failure here? I can see one person's head nodding. The common point of failure is this circuit breaker. If that circuit breaker goes into breaker failure, you have to trip both of the lines adjacent to it. Does that make sense? And after we, for, we spent about a week just wringing our hands thinking, oh no, because it was going to be a big deal. What we're going to have to do is move this line down to that position and slide this line to this position. Well, look how far that would have taken it. We would have had to put in another transmission tower here. It would have taken us months and months. It, it just was, ugh. so we finally decided that it just wasn't worth the hassle of making that change. About two years later, substation is in service and they're testing the breaker failure scheme. And I can already tell by your smiles, you know what's coming. There was a human error, and they, that breaker, breaker failure scheme accidentally got tripped. There was a test switch. The testman forgot to open, and it tripped the lockout relay associated with that breaker failure scheme. And they were able to uh, close it, because he knew what he did. I'm sure he picked the phone up and said, ah, help dispatch. And right away they closed back in, but they just they they outaged the whole west half of Portland, including Nike and Intel and all the other people out there. So anyway, we all spent then spent the next week kicking ourselves for making a bad decision. So anyway, I, I, it's a kind of an interesting thing to kind of worth uh, a story I think that was worth sharing. So. Anyhow, all right, in this class, I've tried to give you a good introduction to how we back up breakers and how we, uh, and how we um, set up breaker failure schemes. And I hope I've given you a good explanation as to why these are so important because the fundamental idea is what I've written right there. All breakers must have a backup. We, it's just unacceptable to have, uh, to, to not have that. Now then, this is, uh, concludes the first kind of stage of this series of classes. And if you think about what we've done over the last four classes, we have uh, both get kind of started off in baby steps, introducing you to, to how the logic in the substation works. Then we spent two classes looking very closely at how circuit breakers operate. Then we spent this class looking at, at, at how we back them up. And I think at, at this point, we've actually beaten to death the concept of circuit breakers pretty well. And so next class, we're going to start looking at line relays. And 
in the next class, we'll, we'll look at the basics of how do you protect a transmission line if you're just wiring up a circuit breaker connected to a transmission line. The class after that, we're going to take those concepts and build upon them to see how you, you set that uh, relaying scheme up when you have communications between the two ends of the line. Okay? And then the, the, the class after that, the, the third of that sequence, we're going to talk about reclosing and explain what you do when you trip a, a circuit breaker on a transmission line, realizing that about, depending on where you are in the country, half to three quarters of your lines, line trips, are just an insulator flashover that's a momentary thing, and once it's cleared, the line can be re-energized. And it's not a, a good, healthy thing to leave lines de-energized that you otherwise need. So anyway, that concludes today and hopefully gives you a little uh, roadmap of where we're going. All right, thank you.